back in. So, um, two or three of y'all asked, okay, so what do you do to do this? Well, I really have a job. I actually work for Harold and Truth. If any of y'all know Harold and Truth, we've been around for, I don't know, 70 something years. I hadn't worked on the whole 70, but for the last 20 almost, I've, I've been one of the preaching voices for Harold and Truth. And my job is to go around and do this. I, I do two things for Harold and Truth. I help people learn. Uh, inspire, motivate, equip them to talk to people about Jesus. Or the other thing to do is send me around to places. And I actually, y'all know the old fashioned gospel meetings? Instead of doing gospel meetings, I go around and do storytelling events where people invite non believing friends to come hear someone talk about Jesus. Very non churchy setting, uh, pretty low key, and I just tell Jesus stories. And, and that's, so that's what I kind of do. So, uh, people ask me to come and then they let me because I, I do a lot of that for them in mission places. But then they say, hey, anytime churches want you, you can go. And so I do things like equip and then people like join my here and say, hey, would you come do that for our church? And so uh, that's what we, that's what I do. Uh, and I'm blessed to do that. And I meant to tell you, uh, most of you who have probably seen them, I, I've got, there's a book, Followers Making Followers, that's not all the same material because things change, but a lot of the same material. And I've got one called Can I Tell You a Story? Um, they're, I don't know, they cost money. They're $14 for one and $13 for the other, or two for $25. Now, Marsha keeps up with that and writes it out for me because our, our bookkeeper at work, our financial person at Harold Proof, got real frustrated with me coming in and doing this with a bunch of money. I took books, I sold some there. <laughs> How many did you sell? I don't know, but here's the money I got. Well, what would you charge? I, I don't know, I just collected money and here it is. And so they told me never to touch money again. I make Marcy go now. So. But if you, uh, and I, some of y'all have heard this, but I mean, I like this group so much. If you buy a book and want a signature for $10, I will sign your book. <laughs> for $100, I'll carry it to your car. <laughs> and for a thousand, I'll come home and read it to you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'd be happy to sign it if you want those. And so, uh, so I told you that to tell you next weekend, I'm going to be in Caribou, Maine, with a little church of 30 people doing this, the same seminar. Uh, Saturday morning, the preaching, because they, uh, not just churches of Christ, there's not a church of Christ within a couple of hours of them. There are very few churches of any kind. And up in Northeast Maine. And they want to reach people for Jesus. They said, if we die out, we want to die out trying to make new believers. And so, I, man, so we've been helping them. We're going to be up there next weekend. Uh, two weeks after that, or maybe a week and a half after that, I'm out in Morro Bay, California, San Luis Obispo, a Cascadero, a Morro Bay. All of the churches in Morro Bay, and by all the churches, I mean... Almost every church in more of an evangelical, Presbyterian, I think the Lutherans are going to be involved, and the Church of Christ is leading it. Pretty cool thing. And I'm going out there to tell Jesus stories. And, and how the other churches got involved, they heard about it and said, we, Moral Bay needs a revival. There's just a handful of Christians in, in this pagan place. Can we be involved? And they said, well, we're death, burial, and resurrection, baptism, Lord, supper, love God, love your neighbor, people. Can, is that okay? And they all said, yeah, we'll, we'll buy into all that. And so we're, I'll be out there doing, I think, four nights where they've rented a community center, inviting people to come, very non churchy and I'm just going to get up and tell Jesus stories. So that kind of gives you a little bit about what, what I do and how we do this, and God has blessed me. And as long as, as long as I've got help and as long as she remembers who I am when I come back, <laughs> we're, I'm going to keep doing this, till I, I guess, till I can it is. I, sometimes my travel schedule does get a little tough. We've got a, anybody here love dogs? Okay, we we've got a big golden retriever that lays by my on my by my side on the floor by my bed. But she's got a little I don't know Maltese like devil dog or something <laughs> that, that jumps up, gets up in our bed and somehow gets up in between us. Well, especially my golden retriever, retriever was a little younger. I would leave and she would roll over and sleep on my side. The golden retriever would get up and sleep on her side. And the little Shih Tzu would sleep on my, or a little Mount Maltese, didn't it? Whatever she was. Would sleep <laughs> on my pillow. 
And sometimes I'd be gone so much, I'd come in and say, I'm home, and all three of them would growl. <laughs> so I know I'd be going too much. So as long as she doesn't growl and, and the dogs don't growl too much, I'm, I'm, that's what I do. Well, we're going to talk about how you need to go out in your world. And you need to go out in your world living as a forgiven person. One of the biggest obstacles we have for reaching people for Jesus, two things. Sometimes they don't see much difference in us or them. And it's kind of hard to say, don't you want to be part of this great thing? You can be just like me. And they're like, I'm better than you already. Mm. But part of that is because we don't know how to communicate. Listen, it's not that we're so good. It's that we're so forgiving. And we're getting that. You know, we, we really need to think a little bit. When our appeal, I, I know for a long time, some of you grew up with this. Here's a way to convert everybody. Here's what the Bible says. Just do it. I mean, that's how we learn. We grew up saying the Bible says this, the Bible says that, so let me convince you the right stuff, and you'll come and our church will grow because we're, we're, we're right. The way to attract people today, if you say you want to study the Bible, for most people, the answer is study the Bible. No, I don't want to study the Bible. I mean, I think I've got a Bible. It, it, it's that big, where was that big book we used to have? Somebody gave it because we got married 30 years ago. I don't know. They don't know the Bible. They don't study the Bible. Most people don't even necessarily believe the Bible is true in our culture. And so you know what attracts people today? A lie live differently. Somebody that does say, we do know the answers to the problems in the world. And we are getting better because of it. And so we're going to talk about learning how to go into our world, not as perfect people, as imperfect people that have something to share. The story is in John 8. If you read the story in John 8, you will see a little footnote that says this was not in some of the earliest manuscripts. Which makes some people wonder, is was it really in Scripture to start with? I think if it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts, maybe the story wasn't originally in, in the text. But obviously somebody at some point copied it in. And the next scribe copied it. The next, why did somebody say, hey, this didn't happen. Why are you putting that there? Well, I feel I think, I assume it probably did happen. I think that was probably an authentic story for the life of Jesus. So when somebody saw it, it was like, oh yeah. And just kept writing, and that's kind of how it got in. So I think this story is probably authentic, even if it wasn't in the earliest manuscripts. And it's the story of the woman caught in adultery. And I'm going to tell you why this is a powerful message for us to learn how we're going to live in this world. She was caught, not suspected of, not somebody said, you know, that same camel been in front of her tent for the last four nights. Not, you know, I've seen that guy come out of that tent three times, and, or I've seen three different guys come out of that tent caught in the act. And they drug her before Jesus where he's speaking. It would be as if tomorrow morning your elders came in dragging some lady and pushed her down to the front and said, we just caught her in the act of adultery. My math is not real good. I mean, I, I, it's a, I, yeah, I just, I'm not one of the real smart guys. But adultery, and they brought the woman. What seems to be missing in the story? Yeah, you assume there's a guy. Now, I don't know if they burst in and said, caught you. Oh, John, I didn't know it was you. I stood out the back door. Or I don't know if they set her up. I don't even know why she was in the act of adultery. I don't know if they thought they were in love. I don't know if they were in lust. I don't know if he was paying her. I don't know if she felt like that's the only way she could survive. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if this was, if they got drunk on camel alcohol. I don't know what the deal is. But they caught her. And they dragged her in for all the religious people. Some of us wish we didn't, but some of us have some experience with your sin being known. Some of you, your sins have always been pretty well hidden. But how would you like it if I told you tomorrow morning we're going to give a roll call and when we call out your name, we're going to announce your worst sin? <coughs> some of you are going, it doesn't matter. Everybody knows. They won't be surprised. And some of you are going, no, boy, no, uh, they would not. Okay, you know, there she is. 
She is humiliated and she is ashamed. Maybe she's a little defiant. And the world wants to pile on the shame and the guilt and the humiliation. People in your world who do not believe in Jesus still grapple with things they have done and things they have not done. Because we are made in the image of God. And there's a lot of built in in people, right and wrong knowledge. And there are people that know the things they have done really aren't right. And they know they should have done some things that they did not do. And they wrestle with that. And when you really mess up your life, the world piles on the shame and the guilt and the humiliation because that's how Satan works. How could you? What were you thinking? That is terrible. You should not have. And you remember what Jesus does? He starts riding on the ground. When I get to heaven, I'm going to find out what he wrote. And I'm going to have a lot of time, so I'm going to do that. I, I, I've always wondered, what did he sit down and did he say to himself, okay, I came for people like her. Or I came for people like these guys who are judging her. Or did he write to them, I love you. Did he write, I love you, so the lady would see it. Did he write, I love you, so the guys who brought her in would see it. For all I know, he started writing the guys that brought her in and listening to their scenes. Maybe he started the woman. Maybe her name was Annabelle. And he wrote, Annabelle, adultery. Fred, lust. Jim, steals. Bill, mean. I, I don't know. Maybe he starts writing their scenes. Maybe they see those. And he says, okay, whoever's out sin, cast the first stone. Now, you, you know who could have thrown the rock, by the way, don't you? What's the answer always? Jesus. Jesus. You know, Jesus could have because he didn't have any sin. And he didn't. And, I, you know, we're hard on those religious guys. But I love it because you know the first guy to get it? The oldest guy there. He figured it out. He said, man, what are we doing? And left. And then the rest of them went right behind him. No one here to condemn you? No. No one. Neither do I go your way and sin no more. I want to tell you, for those of you that wrestle with who are you to go talk about Jesus because you had not always had it together and sometimes your life hadn't been what it should have been and sometimes the people you've worked with for 20 years know that 15 of those you've been a really good Christian and five of them not. The people in your neighborhood, you're like, you know, we've been talking to my neighbor about Jesus, but you know, when that tree fell over, I mean, I was telling my opinion. I meant to give him a peace sign, but only half of it got up, so he's probably kind of mad at me, you know? Yeah, I know, we've all done those things. You think, well, I wish, hmm, that's awkward, this is embarrassing. And you know what? We need to know that our job is to go in the world and live forgiven. The world brings condemnation. Jesus brings forgiveness. And that's what... Our message to the world is not come follow Jesus and be good like me. Our message is come follow Jesus and be forgiven like me. We're the forgiven people. Not the perfect people. Not always the good people. I'm going to tell you, I know non-believers who are better people than I am. We know non-believers who are good neighbors. We know non-believers who do anything for anybody else. I know non-believers who would tell you I'm an atheist or believe in, in a in a God that's different than our God, and they are good people. But they're not forgiven. You see, we, we have messed up if we think that Jesus' appeal is come be good like us. Come be the right church like us. Come. We're about Jesus. Come be forgiven like me. And we are trying to go into our world and sin. You know, you know the difference between Christians that do something bad and the world that does something bad? We're sorry. And if we're really sorry and truly repentant, we'll go to our friends, we'll go to our elders and wives, we'll go to someone and say, man, help me. I am struggling with, I did, I didn't do, please help me. And you know what? We'll try to get better. I mean, most of us that are growing up in Jesus, aren't you better than you were five years ago? Or 15 years ago? Or 30 years ago? So that's, we, we've got to know, I, I'm going to tell you, you're not out there telling people because you're so good. You are out there because you are so forgiven. Much like this man. You know the story in 2 Samuel, 
11 and 12. The other kings go to war and David didn't go. So he wasn't going. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. And he got in trouble. David got in trouble. Either, okay, okay, everybody doesn't like this. I'm just going to take up for the ladies here. You know who soft this whole thing is? It's David. What a lecture. I mean, he's the king. He can have anybody. Poor Bathsheba's husband at war. And man, David, no, no. That's not fair to the guys. Guys, it was not David's fault. It's all that she was fault. I'm mean, parading around the room, taking a bath. Yeah. It was her fault, not David's. Or maybe it was both of them's faults. Maybe she was taking a bath where she shouldn't have, and maybe David was looking where he shouldn't have. Maybe it was two people and, who were weak and got thrown together. I mean, Satan is devious. So, David goes on this little journey of, huh, I see her and she's beautiful. Who is that? And I love the unnamed servant that said, it's your wife. I mean, somebody tried to say, David, that's a married lady. He didn't listen. Sent her a note. She answered it. She came and they slept together. I'm not sure they slept, but had sex together and she gets pregnant. Okay, I was waiting for somebody to yell Jesus. I was going to say, yes, the point of this story will be Jesus eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she got pregnant. So David made it right. So he could marry her. So everybody think it was... Well, we, we've got to learn in the church, if we're going to attract non-believers to real forgiveness, we've got to learn to deal with sin among us. Not by condemning each other, but by forgiving each other and helping it to be better. We've got, to, we've got to learn to talk about our sin, even in our fellowship. We've got to learn it's okay to go to someone and say, I am struggling. I am in trouble. Instead of trying to hide it and hide it and hide it until it blows up. Of course, you remember how that all plays out. David <laughs> brings her husband home. And then when she turns up pregnant, they like, remember when he came home on leave? <laughs> yeah. And then the guy wouldn't do it. Remember? He wouldn't go home to see her. He said, my, my soldiers are out in the field. I, I, I can't go to my wife while they're out there. Now, you could argue that says something about their marriage. It's not very healthy, and that may be right. Maybe they had a bad marriage. I, I would worry that somebody that loved his soldiers more than he loved his wife. I, I do. But having said that, David even got him drunk, and still didn't go home. So finally, he couldn't figure out what to do. So told his commander, involve somebody else, to leave him in front of the battle, withdraw from him, and he was killed in battle. He's a hero, and I'm going to marry the grieving widow, and then our child will be legitimate. Sometimes even when Christians find that kind of thing, make it right. You don't make it right by getting married, you make it right by getting forgiveness. And so then they have the baby, you remember the baby? Dies. David has that great statement of faith where he sees the servant. He, he's, he's fasting and he's praying and he sees the servants talking and he realizes the baby's died. He says, bring me food. I'm going to clean it up. They say, well, wait a minute. Don't you have that backward when the baby was alive? He said, no. He said, I thought maybe God would spare a child. And now he's gone. And he says, I cannot go to him. Uh, he cannot come to me, but I and go to him. The great statement of faith in heaven that he will be with that baby again. And then God sends Nathan, the amazing prophet of God, who tells David that heartbreaking story about the guy that's got all the, little, all the animals having a big feast. He goes and takes the little lamb from the guy. It was like a pet in the family, like a member of the family. And David, and David was so incensed. And he said, that man should be put to death. It's hard. We're not going to have that in my kingdom. And Nathan said, well, oddly enough, David, that's you. You're the man. And I'm always struck by David's response. He doesn't defend it. He doesn't get mad at Nathan. He says, I've sinned. And if you go then and read the 51st Psalm, it is the great psalm of forgiveness. And as we get ready to go out among the people who know us and who know we are not perfect, this is what we, this is the message we want to speak to each other. This is the message we want to live. This is who we want to be. This is who people are brought in to be. 
it, when they come to Jesus in, in our fellowship. We can't possibly cover all of, of Psalm 51 this morning. But let me just share it. Let me just hit some highlights that go through this. Have mercy on me because you love me and hurt for me. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my evil and cleanse me from my sin. I know my sin and it is always with me. I sinned against you above all. I did evil. Let me be real clear on those last two things. When you're in sin and quit, Satan wants you to live in that sin for the rest of your life. If he can't get you to keep doing the sin, he wants you to live in the memory of that sin forever. David says, man, my sin's always in front of me. Hard to get, get, get away from it. And he says, I've sinned against you above all. We tend to think sin's worse depending on how many people it affects, but sin's fundamentally an issue between you and your God. And so the people we're talking to about coming to Jesus, what we're doing is giving them the avenue to get back to God after their sin has separated them from God. You are right and just in your words, acknowledging that God is right. I'm so bad, I must have been a sinner since birth. You want truth. And you can fix this. You cleanse me, and I will be clean. You can wash me whiter than snow. I want joy and happiness. I want these crushed bones to rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot it out. Create in me a pure heart. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not throw me away or take away your Holy Spirit. Restore me to the joy of your salvation. Give me the willing spirit to keep on. And listen to what he says here. Then I will teach other sinners your ways. And they will turn back to you. One of your greatest motivating factors for the people in your world who don't know Jesus is to look in the mirror and realize what Jesus has done for you. And that He wants you to do the same for them. People sometimes ask why I just have this burning desire, this passion for everybody I know to know Jesus. If you knew how good Jesus had been to me, that there's a whole world out there that needs to hear that message. And then he says things like this. Save me from this guilt that I will sing of your righteousness and declare your praises. I will do whatever you ask, but you're not just looking for action. You want a broken spirit to come right heart, and that you will not despise or reject. And that's why David's called a man after God's own heart. God knew David's heart. David sought God's heart even as a sinner. Forgive me and I will speak of your forgiveness to others. I'll tell sinners and they will come to you. Maybe your sin and maybe the people that know your sin, that may become your greatest witness and your greatest testimony to people who are lost, to people who know that you're not perfect, but you are preaching, teaching, telling forgiveness. So I want to tell you about my friend, Ken Jones. <coughs> Ken's kind of a rough guy. He, uh, he was converted as a young teenager. And he says, I got baptized, fell in love, got married, left the Lord. Stayed away a long time. He'll tell you, if he were here, Ken would say, I've broken every one of the Ten Commandments but one. And that's because the gun was fired. Other than that, I violated all the Ten Commandments. Uh, Abilene used to be a dry city, and he was one of the last bootleggers to bring liquor into Abilene. 
And as he got on, his wife stayed faithful the whole time. Nita stayed faithful through the whole thing. And Ken decided to come back to the Lord. And when he decided to come back to the Lord, he, uh, he, he said, I wanted to pick a church where I could kind of hide and get lost. And of course, God never really lets you get away with that. And so he got pretty active where I was in, at going to church then, where I was an elder. Ken called me one day and said, can I come meet with the elders? I need to talk to the elders. I said, you bet. He said, well, don't you need to get it on the agenda? Don't you need to know? And I said, Ken, if something's going on in your life, nothing's more important to us, so just show up. Okay, so Ken walks in. What do you want to do, Ken? And here's what comes out of Ken's mouth. You guys know I am an alcoholic. Spent years drunk. Did a lot of things I wish I hadn't done. And he said, you know, when I got sober and came back to the Lord, I, I started wanting to reach people. He said, you know, sometimes I still go to the bar before everybody looked up. He said, but I sit there with a glass of water, and I, everybody knows I'm there talking about Jesus. And so I want the people that were like I was to know there's a different life. And I'm trying to show them that life. So everybody says, that's great, Ken. Well, and everybody's at a boy, and you know, and good for you. And except for me, he said, you know, I'll take somebody with you just to be safe. But having said that, <laughs> then he says, so here's what I want to do. Okay, we're all looking, and this next thing out of his mouth, I want to start a church. In a bar. Okay. I don't know what you're I don't have a case. Y'all get a quest like that. And everybody goes, hmm. Okay. And I'm like, that's a great idea. And Ken says, because the alcoholics I know aren't coming in this building. Even though there's a lot of guys they see on Friday and Saturday nights. I'm like, kind of hurt. But okay. And then he says, I think if we had church in a bar, they'd come. So I'm like, man. Okay, this is great. Let's pray about this. And you're right, this is a great way to reach people. And about half our elders are going, we wait for somebody to give an answer or they don't. Do and then finally somebody says, okay, this is great. He leaves all excited. And the guy that said that turns us, there's not going to be any bar let him do a church service. We don't have to worry about this. I'm like, well, that's kind of bad. Maybe we ought to. Next week, King says, calls me and says, I need to come to the elders meeting. Okay. He comes in and says, I've got the bar. <laughs> Seriously? He said, yeah. I was at the grocery store and one of the girls that, that bartends at one of the places I go try to talk to people, she said, hey, Ken, how you doing? He said, I want to have church and bar. And she says, you know what? I think the guy that owns a bar where I attend bar, I think he'd let you do a church service. When do you want to do it? He said, well, Sunday. When y'all open on Sunday? She said, yeah, we open at noon. He says, I'm going to do it at 11. <laughs> and she said, I, I think he'll let you. And then he comes into the other room and says, we're going to do this. Then what do you do? We said, you know what, Ken? Let's get at it. Start inviting people. Start bringing people. And I want to be honest. For a while, it got sidetracked. Because we had some guys that wanted to be all about the image. How cool is it to be a church that has a church in a bar? But there were also some people that got real serious about it. They started running the van, picking up people at halfway houses and bringing them. All the people that said, I don't want to go to church where you guys go, they show up there. They don't do church just like we would do it. But you know what? Every year they baptize 10, 15, 20 people at Bar Church. You know who the best evangelist is at Bar Church? It's the Wiley High School right outside Adam, Adam Wiley. It's their head football coach, Clay Martin. When we started this, he was the head baseball coach. He is where I got by, involved. And in the summer when, when Clay wasn't coaching, he drove the van to go pick up these guys. And here's how he became the greatest evangelist. They'd be going on and be saying, hey, how's your life? Well, it's kind of messed up. Not real good. They said, man, I know I've been there. I blew a marriage and I had a bad life. And they said, really? What happened? So well, I found Jesus and he fixed it. Said, yeah, he can fix anybody's life. He's fixed mine. You know my wife now and we love him. We do this because God's been good to us. Wow, what do I do? He said, well, I, I was baptized. He kind of went to die with Jesus and be raised. Well, can you do that? He said, yeah. Yeah, we've got a cow cough <laughs> by the bar. We'll, Fill it up, or we'll take you to my house and baptize you in a swimming pool. You know, Clay baptizes eight or ten people every year, and here's what he knows to tell them. Yeah, my life was a mess. Jesus fixed it. Wow, can he fix mine? Yes, he can. What do I do? He's died with him and be raised a new life. When can I do that? Well, as soon as I can get to the water, here we go. Yeah, but doesn't he explain all? Doesn't he teach all? Now, he kind of says, Jesus died for you. And your sins can be forgiven. And your life can be fixed. All because Ken who was a great sinner, 
became a great evangelist. And for those of you that have heard some of my, can I tell you a story? If the Jimmy and Jamie Moreno, the couple whose son committed suicide, and then we ended up baptizing Jimmy and Paul. Ken's the guy that they called to help them through that. And, and you know how much Bible knowledge Ken has? Just what he's read. I don't think he's ever gone to, I don't think he ever went to college to stay recruited. Doesn't know a lot of Bible. Not very gifted. Kind of intimidating, kind of scary sometimes. But he just goes and reads. He is one of the greatest sinners I know who became one of the greatest evangelists I've ever known. And you're thinking, so what's the point of all that? Find your bar church. I don't know if it's having your neighbors over for coffee. I don't know if it's having a neighborhood cookout saying, hey, we're going to do a little Bible study or tell a little Bible story. I don't know if it's having people over to have a meal and to share your testimony, your story with them. I, I don't know what your bar church looks like. I, I don't know. I don't know what it looks like for this church. I don't know what it looks like for your church. I don't know. I don't, but I do know this. Great sinners can become great evangelists. And you figure out who it is you can talk to. For Ken, he went to talk to the people he knew best. Who he used to be just like. And most of them knew that. I also want to tell you, if we're going to be people that are really going to take seriously this whole living forgiven out in the world so they're drawn to us, we've got to really be people who forgive, not just live forgiven, but also forgive. You know the story of Philip, the evangelist. You know, he was in Jerusalem, ends up going down to Samaria. He's the one that converts to Ethiopian in Acts 8. Great story. Uh, he, he listens to God, and that's the story where the Holy Spirit connects Ethiopian and Philip. A non-believer to believe. I still think the Holy Spirit does that. I think the Holy Spirit has you where you are. Because I, I think God may work just like this. I've got people in that neighborhood that need me. And some of them are seeking me. They don't even know it yet. How am I going to get that to them? I'm going to take one of my believing families and I'm going to get them to get a house right there in that neighborhood. Anybody else hear that? Okay, I feel better. I thought maybe I was broken out. So just move me out of the way and finish up the and then take me home. I love you, dear. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, maybe that's God's that the house you bought that you didn't know how you could afford that or how it happened. Maybe that was God. Because an angel told Philip to go to the road, the Holy Spirit to go to the chariot, Philip did. Great, great story. After he baptizes the Ethiopian, he's caught up, the Holy Spirit drops from the Zodas, he preaches way to Caesarea. And he stays there because he's still there uh, later in the book of Acts with the Apostle Paul and his missionary on one of his missionary journeys is going to Caesarea. Now you remember Paul, who Paul used to be? Saul? Yeah. And you remember what happened? Saul persecuted Christians. In fact, Saul is the one who really spearheaded the efforts to martyr Stephen, the great evangelist. Now, I was named for Stephen in the Bible. I grew up hearing he was a great preacher, and I thought, that's so great. And my parents, they want me to, great, be, me to be a great preacher. One day I was reading the story of Stephen and found out he died after one of his big sermons. I wasn't surprised to do that. I tried to go by Joel for a while. My middle was at the end of the so. No, I'm kidding. I, I really was named for him. And I, Stephen was such a great preacher, he was martyred. And Philip was one of the best friends. Well, how do you know that? Well, when the church had its trouble in Acts 6, and they got some special servants, to help the situation. The first two admissions are Stephen and Philip. So I know they did ministry together, preaching buddies. And so Saul is confronted by Jesus, becomes a passionate evangelist, great sinner, becomes a great evangelist. And over in Acts 21, you got to love Scripture. Acts 21 and verse 7, it says, All his companions stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist. That, that's all it says. You understand what's behind all of that? Paul to his people. Okay, where's our next stop? Caesarea. Great, let's go reach some people there. You know, there's a pretty active church there. Oh, yeah, who? Well, it, there's a guy named Philip who's the great evangelist. And that's his nickname. They call him the Evangelist. Has four daughters who are faithful believers. They prophesied. Now, I don't know what all that means. I, those daughters prophesied. I don't know what all that means. But here's my takeaway. He first talked to his kids. I mean, they were faithful kids. He 
So Philip's not just an evangelist out there. He, he did it at home too. And Paul says, okay, where are we going to stay? Where are we going to stay with Philip? Is that the same Philip that was in Jerusalem and went out of Samaria? Yeah, why? Oh, you, oh. I can't imagine Paul's thinking, what, what are they going to do when I knock on that door? Hey, Philip, you remember your good friend Stephen? I'm the guy that killed him. But, hey, I'm here. Man, hey, can you imagine? Oh, what, do you, what does Philip say? Hey, I got, a, I got a message. I guess he didn't get an email. He got a camel mail or whatever they did. Hey, I got this message, and Paul is companion. Paul. Oh. Yeah, what's the matter, Phil? Well, I'm, I knew who you saw. You know, my best bud, Stephen. I can only imagine how they must have gone when they did this. We're here. Philip opens the door. Everybody comes running in. And I wonder if Paul said, Philip, I don't know if you remember, but I'm the guy. And I think Philip probably would have stopped him. He said, Brother Paul, I'm so proud of your decision. I'm so happy for what you're doing. I love you. Please come in my house. Not because he still didn't love Stephen, not because he still didn't grieve over what had happened to Stephen, but because we not only live forgiven, we live forgiving. And the reason we're going to be attractive to people in the world is when they say they get along, they make it work. They not just forgive themselves, they forgive others. We've got to. How, what a great reputation to cultivate. Uh, for a long time, one of the churches we were at had a reputation in town. And Christians would say this a little bit mockingly. They'd say, oh yeah, over there, that's where all the screwed up people go. And I always kind of thought, they'd say, man, that's a hard I think that's a great reputation to have. I wish every church, I wish all over Kaufman, they'd say, landmark, you know where all the screwed up people go? You betcha. So we get fixed. And you're screwed up, we welcome you. Because we all were too. And God forgives and makes us in the disciples. He can do that for you. It is a great, we've got to be those kind of people that are willing to learn to forgive others. That's the great message of, of Paul and Philip. Peter may have been one of the all-time great evangelists. The story we're going to talk about briefly is in Luke 5. Peter and Andrew become Jesus' followers. You know, Andrew finds Jesus, comes home and tells Peter, we found him a sign. It's, it's a great story. Jesus comes along one day and he's going to preach to the people. Peter and Andrew have fished all night. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever fished all night, but I have several times, and I've been like them many times, I've caught nothing. But it's not my job. I mean, I don't have to call Marsha and say, honey, we're not going to eat this week because I didn't catch anything. Nothing to eat, nothing to sell. I mean, she didn't really expect me to bring home fish most of the time. So. <laughs> but that was her job. And on the shore, they're cleaning up their nets after fishing all night. And Jesus says, Peter, put me in the boat and take me out. I'm going to speak to the people. And I'm going to tell you, Philip's me. I mean, Peter is an incredible man. And here's why. He's been up all night working. He goes out on a boat on those gentle waves and listens to the guy preach for I don't know how long. And so apparently stays awake. The guy is my hero for that, if nothing else. So they preach. And then Jesus says this. We're going, let's let out for a catch of fish. Not let's go fishing out there. Let's go get a catch of fish. And, and Peter says, <clears throat> Well, why did Peter say that? Was he trying to keep Jesus from being embarrassed? You know, sometimes we think we have to defend Jesus. Listen, you know, I, yeah, do you guys really believe you have to live like, well, yeah, we do, but you know, you have to defend Jesus. I don't know what Peter was thinking if he was saying, Jesus, I don't fish up. I mean, I appreciate what you said, but it's going to be embarrassing because there aren't any fish. But I love Peter's faith because he says, but because it's you, we'll let down the nets. I'm going to take exactly what Peter was thinking. I don't have any fish out there. I'm a professional fisherman. We five. They're not there. 
But Jesus, if you tell me to do this, in spite of all the evidence to the contrary, I will let down our nets. I love people with that kind of faith. We can't possibly do. What are you thinking? And if we do, man, if Jesus wants you to do, do, go, do it. How great would it be if you said, let's bring in and let's do it. And they let down the nets. And you remember what happens? They catch so many fish, the nets start to break. And they're dumping in the boat. And the boat starts to sink because there's so many fish. How great is that? And they bring their partners out. And they're going, it's fantastic. In the middle of all that, you remember what Peter does? He falls on his knees and says, get away from me. I am a sinful man. It's a great story for a number of reasons for the people that just, you know, if you knew who I really was, you wouldn't want me to be in your church, you wouldn't want me to come visit with you, you wouldn't want me to be a part of you if you just knew who I, I get all that. I do. Peter must have felt that way. When he sees the incredible power of Jesus, all you think is, what's a guy like you doing with a guy like me? So who is Jesus to look at a bunch of people like you I say, I want you to go out among my world where you live and tell your friends about me. <laughs> what is he thinking? I mean, I don't know all y'all, but I know some of y'all, and we are not, we're not exactly the cream of the crop, except Jesus makes us. He equips us. He's going to be with us. It is about Him. It is not about us. So we want to share our good news of the world because we are forever grateful. We sinners really understand and get it. So, the same Peter wrote a book. First Peter. Flip over there or scroll over there to the book of First Peter for a couple minutes. We're going to spend just a little time there and then we'll wrap up this section here in a minute. And I just want to highlight a couple of things out of 1 Peter. Second chapter. And look at verse 9. We're just going to hit four or five verses real quick. Look at verse 9, 2 Peter 2. Uh, 1 Peter 2. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. One way we go out in our world as forgiving people who live forgiving and forgiving it is we give credit to Jesus and to God. We don't say, when they say, when our neighbor says, hey, new truck, boy, good for you. Yeah, God bless me. God, would God get you that truck? Yeah, I think so. What do you mean? Well, I'd love to tell you. Can you come over, can I tell you the story? What kind of goes next? Or, hey, you got a promotion at work. Sure did. God's good. Oh, yeah. Hey, how'd your test results come back? Man, they're, they're clean. Uh, praise God. Really? Yeah. Or, man, I, I think it's, they say it's bad. Oh, I'm sorry. No, God's good. It'll be okay. How can you say that? I'd love to tell you that. We declare His praises. And please hear this. We declare His praises when it is good. And we declare His praises when it is not the way we want it to be. Because if we only praise God when it's good, then we are saying, God, I love you as long as you are good to me. And the point is, God's always good to us. We don't define goodness. And when things don't come out like we want them to, what's the worst thing that happens to you? You get bad test results and die. What's the worst thing that happens? Huh, you get to go to heaven and be with God forever. This world is not our home. Now, that doesn't mean our people are not going to grieve us and we're not going to be sad, but you know, all these trips, I die on one of these and don't get home to Marsha. I hope she will grieve me. Dogs will miss me. They won't have to growl anymore. But, <laughs> but you know what? It'll be okay because she'll be along pretty quick. We'll be there forever with God in heaven. That's, our, that's where we're going. And so we declare His praises. And for those of you that are exuberant worshipers, for those of you that kind of, you know, sometimes we feel like going to church, we need to be really calm, dignified, and 
It's like we're saying, hey world, you're not so mess. Come be happy like us. Okay, I'm here, let's be happy. We are happy, happy, happy. <laughs> Man, some of us look like we were baptized in pickle juice. We do, we got to quit that. I mean, our, our church service, I'm not telling you, well, maybe I am. I, we need to look more like parties than funerals at church. We have been saved by God. Jesus died for us. We're going to live in heaven forever. <laughs> I, I, I get, let's be respectful, let's be dignified, but I also kind of get the guy that wants the little community to jump up and yell, thank you, Jesus. I get that. I, sometimes, you don't have to be exuberant like me, that's kind of part of my personality, I get it. But sometimes when people say, I just can't raise my hand up and I say, I get it. But if you really knew what God has done for me, it's hard not to. We need to be declaring His praises. Verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. One of the great witnesses. They may accuse us of doing wrong bad things. You know, the first century they called them cannibals. You know why they called them cannibals in the first century? Yeah, communion. All that blood and flesh, I mean, that body of Jesus. They called them incestuous. You know why? A whole lot of brother, sister, holy kids. Why are they doing over there? <coughs> called them atheists. How, why would you call a Christian an atheist? How many gods do we believe in? Which means we don't believe in all the other gods, so we are therefore atheists. People ever say things aren't true about us? Like maybe you guys are judgmental, unloving, harsh, cruel. We get a lot of things said about us that aren't true. And you know what offsets that? They may see your good deeds. You know, we Christians are the people who show up to the sick people and the hurting people. Sometimes we risk our life. We put our money and our efforts into helping people. Chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, in the same way you submit to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. I think that applies to all of us. They may not want to study the Bible, but they keep watching us live lives in front of them that are different, that are forgiven lives. We are getting better. We are putting our lives out for people. That matters. And then finally, of course, verse 15 of chapter 3, where it says this, But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Set aside Jesus in our heart and be ready to give an answer when people ask us why we live as forgiven people. One more story and then we'll give you a short break. Margot got married young, got divorced, single mom trying to raise kids, life was hard. It, Mar it was tough for Margot. She got a job working at Abilene Christian University in Abilene. She got a job in her department in a, in a department with a bunch of uh, sweet older ladies who kind of became surrogate moms to her. I mean, Margot would come into work and she'd say things like, man, I went out with this guy and he wasn't very nice. And, and they would say things like, you know, you are worthy of respect. You don't have to go out with me. They would coach her on dating and she would say, I don't know what to do about my kids. And some of them would say, well, well my kids were grown. Or one of them would say, I was a single mom and here's what I did. And they just, talked to her and they did life with her and started coaching her in life. And finally one of them said, would you like to come to church? She said, you know, maybe I would because there's something in your lives that I, when I'm your age, I want to look back and be able to say to somebody, here's how I got through it. Y'all are helping me. You've got something I need and want. Showed up at church and we, Marsh and I met her and we started telling Jesus stories with Margaret. She met a guy. They coached her through dating and they were going to get married. Then they decided not to. And then they kind of floundered around. One day she called and said, can we pick back up with the Jesus studies? 
Yes, we can. And you start talking about Jesus. And they decided to get married. Those little old ladies she worked with in that department, you know who gave her showers? You know who put the wedding on for her? You know who did all the reception? Those sweet little ladies. Even helped her chip in and buy her wedding dress. That's the day we baptized Margaret. Because she said, y'all got something I want. And I know Jesus is where I get that. And there's no way everybody would help somebody like me as much as they did if it wasn't for Jesus. You know what converted her? It wasn't the amazing Jesus storytelling ability I had. It wasn't even sweet Marsha always coaching her and helping her. It, it, what converted her was all those ladies saying, we love you. Jesus helped us. Jesus got us through. Jesus can get you through. Here, we do this. Why are you helping me? Because we love Jesus. Would you like to come to church where Jesus people are? That's what got Margo interested in following Jesus. So we're going to live forgiven so the world will see that Jesus really does change lives and because you love Jesus with everything you have. Okay, we're going to give you a five-minute break. I